Welcome to the Strategy Mob Podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Strategy Mob. Today, I have two very special guests, both sales professionals. Do I get to call you guys sales professionals? That that sounds so, weird. But sounds I'll cool. It. I'm gonna call. It, all right, all right. Well, they're, they're professionals in my eyes. I mean, <laughs> it could be up for debate. <laughs> Not too much sales going on right now. Well, that's but, true. Good point. I have, bo- I have both Sean and Paul with me today, um, which is cool because you guys are from both different sides of the country. So we're gonna get some different perspectives on it. But before we kind of get things kicked off here, I think some origin stories would actually be really cool to start off. Sean, let's uh, let's start with you. How did you get started in the automotive? Of industry? Yeah, good question. So uh, when I was about 13 or 14, my brother was the GM for a Toyota dealership. So one of the larger Toyota dealerships in Ireland. I'm Irish. So I started working. I had no idea you were. I could I would never guess that you were Irish, really. Yeah, in the detailing department. So just came in there as a bus boy, basically. So wash cars, vacuum cars, that kind of stuff. Um, and did that as a weekend job and a summer job. And then eventually Maybe when I was 17 or 18, he asked me to put on a, a, a suit because one of the sales guys was sick or something. He said, come in, just make tea and coffee for the people in the showrooms, things like that, and bring them on test drives if the sales guys are busy, you know, chaperone customers. And uh, I did that. I enjoyed it. I was basically doing everything except for essentially making the commission at one point. Um, I left then... Uh, I left then to go to university. That wasn't really for me. I only went to school because that's where the bus stopped, to be honest. Um, And then I got into uh, furniture sales. So I was in furniture sales for about two years. Really enjoyed it. It was good money. I was, you know, 1920, you know, when you're making your first paychecks, you think that you're, think that you're a millionaire. So enjoyed that. And then uh, this lady came in who was a realtor. So a big whale realtor in the city and she bought, copious amounts of furniture for these apartments that she was renting out. And she was actually married to the guy who owned the Toyota dealership. So she owned half of the franchise. So she said, I know you, you're familiar. And I was like, yeah, you're familiar as well. And she said, are you, you know, uh, Charlie's brother? I said, I am. So then about two weeks later, my brother gave me a phone call and asked me to meet him for a beer. And I thought somebody had died because you know he never would have asked me to work here or anything so i'm like oh shit what's going to happen here so we go for a beer and uh he says listen you know that lady that you met we're looking for a sales guy you impressed her you sold her the furniture do you want to come and like have a real sales job here as a as a junior sales rep so he had me at hello i was like yeah let's do it so i was going from selling furniture to selling cars you know i was uh 2021 20, you're getting a a demo car and you know free insurance so it was like my eyes lit up so i went in there i worked at uh, in sales in toyota then eventually got into um the same franchise as a lexus dealership so worked with lexus and toyota and got into kind of managing the used the used car side of it so then about 2017 so i, think I was there for about four years uh, and then about 2017 my brother who lives here said you know things are going incredible in canada uh, you should come over. So it was easier for me to leave the country than it was to go to another car dealership in Ireland because I had such a good relationship with these guys. You know, wow. it, it would have, it, it was, if I had told them that I was going to Audi down the street or going to Volkswagen or Porsche, they, you know, they'd be like, what? So, uh, yeah, I made the, the choice. I moved to Canada. Uh, I started working in a, an Acura dealership, uh, Berard Acura. And, Loved it. I had never, I had never seen an Acura, and it's, they don't have them in in Europe. So I went and I interviewed with Acura, BMW, a few places. Got offered a few jobs, but the the team that were in Acura were the were the best team for for sure. And I said I'd I'd, I'd give it a chance. Then I was approached by a Chrysler store to become the manager of that store. I won't say which store it was, but it didn't work out. The store wasn't the best. Uh, wasn't the best to their customers. So, and that's not uh, a reflection of Chrysler. That's a reflection of that store. So it w- wasn't, it wasn't a place that I wanted to be. The, the management in charge didn't have morals. Um, no, I was 
the manager there, but the upper management, the morals weren't there. They, they didn't feel like treating their, their customers. So I left the automotive industry for about a month. And then a guy reached out to me on LinkedIn and asked me if I'd be interested in working in a dealership on Burrard and Forth. So for those of you who aren't from Vancouver, Burrard and Forth is Supercar Street. So he wouldn't tell me which one it was, but it was either McLaren, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Rolls-Royce, Aston Martin. So it didn't matter. Whoever it was, I was interested. So I said, okay. So he gave me a grueling interview. It didn't help that I was really hungover. I had just come back from uh, <laughs> uh, went in Ireland. I was really hungover. So he gave me a grueling interview and then a second grueling interview and then told me, listen, it's McLaren. And I'm, you know, McLaren is a, they're, they're a huge Formula One team in Europe. So boyhood fan of, of the F1 team. I used to have pictures of the McLaren, you know, 12C up on my wall when I was growing up. So it's a gorgeous car. Yeah. So like I was, I was sold. So I went into McLaren and at the door, I thought I'm, I'm being punked here. You know, I still thought shit like this is, this is, <laughs> this, this isn't is real. This isn't happening. Yeah, this isn't real. So I went in and I met the, uh, uh, Met, met the sales manager, uh, Kelly Kerr, and the general manager, Morris Lubinich at the time, and did one interview, really tough interview, basically told me why I wasn't good enough for the job. And they said, why are you good enough? So I said, well, I said, in six months, I'll be your number one sales guy. And uh, then they said at the end, have you any questions? And I said, yeah, when do I start? So Morris started laughing, the GM, and he said, no one ever asked me that question ever. He said, in any interview I've ever done. So I started laughing. And I was like, you know, you've you know, you never met me before. So I was just, you know, <laughs> why not? I had nothing to lose. Exactly. So they invited me back for a, uh, a second interview. And after I left the second interview, maybe 15 minutes later, I went to a coffee shop to meet a friend of mine who was also uh, in, uh, in the industry as well. And I'll never forget getting the phone call. So they called me and, and offered me the job. And, you know, I was jumping around the coffee shop. People were looking at me, you know, thinking probably I won the lotto. But to me, I, I, I did. So I am with McLaren now three years approximately. And uh, love it. It's an incredible dealership, incredible brand. Um, it's where I kind of wanted to end up it would either have been, you know, Ferrari, Lamborghini, McLaren, Porsche. So that's where I wanted to end up. The automotive group is FAF. I think you guys know, know FAF over, oh, yeah. over the time. So that's the, the, the only FAF presence is a FAF leasing office in our building and McLaren and just an incredible company to work for. You know, Chris FAF, the way this guy is handling uh, COVID is exceptional, but they're a huge group, not as big here, uh, open road are bigger here and, uh, and Delowry would have more of a presence, but the standard of quality and, and you know, how FAF treat the employees and treat the staff is exceptional. So yeah, I've, I've loved it. I've, I've experienced some incredible things, been met some amazing people. Um, I pinch myself, you know, uh, a lot of the time, like it, I, I was, driving down to the compound. The lock guys are, are not working at the moment. So you're looking at the lock guy here right now. And uh, <laughs> Well, you know what? I think I wouldn't mind being a lock guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. At the McLaren dealership. I think I, I think you can sign me up for that for that role. Yeah. I don't think I, I, I would have a beef with that. You know what's funny, though? I think everybody's, you know, kind of journey into automotive, you know, starts with something, you know, it's, 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 it's always odd, right? You started with a beer and a pub. And yeah, I bet you Paul's probably easier. wasn't far from that either. But let's <laughs> let's let's hear it. Uh, the Dodge father himself. Hey, uh, how did you get started in this industry? Well, we went over this uh, through our podcast, brother. But I was not like the typical one that was born or bred into it. Um, didn't really have anybody lead me towards it either. Um, just sales is sales. You know what you're good at, you find an act. So uh, had a maintenance commercial cleaning company and did the whole factory life. Did pretty much every job, right down to catching chickens milking cows through my uh, early teens and, and 20s and uh, started a maintenance company. Um, blew up pretty good there in my 20s. So about 10 years there, I was uh, doing that, basically owner operator, um, small staff with that, but uh, obviously just going customer to customer, trying to pitch yourself to why I'm a better contractor than the next. Um, but yeah, after 10 years, three, 364 days a year working, I uh, decided this is not the knack for me. Um, so I blew my back out at the gym coincidentally and, uh, realized how much I depended on staff and they were not there for me. So kind of needed to find another outlet. Um, and I just happened to be shopping for a trailer at the time. And I was that guy that went literally lot to lot 
bullshitting my way saying I got this quote from this guy, the guy who I hate. Um, but no, I just, I went and a lot, basically met a bunch of different salesmen. And uh, there's one guy that was down where I actually bought my trailer, even though it was a couple grand more. I really uh, I had a good connection with this guy. He kept up on me. Um, and there's always, you know, one thing my parents always proud me up to in this world is you make money in this world two ways, your back or your brain. Um, so I knew I was sick of doing it on my back. I blew my back out. So it's time to go towards the brain, right? Um, so sales kind of just, I, I had the thought I wanted to be a salesman. I seen what this guy was doing with trailers. And uh, I just basically one day was like, well, what am I going to sell? There's only one thing I want to sell. It's Mopar. It's what I know. It's what I love. I mean, uh, so just happened to be um, scrolling through the, uh, the Kijiji ads or something like that. And coincidentally, Woodstock Chrysler was looking for a sales rep. Needed some Om Vic or something like that. I'm like, yeah, whatever. So called them up and uh, I was actually doing a sandblasting job too at the time. And I got called for the interview. So I uh, told them at the sandblasting place I had a family emergency, needed to go. Literally ran home, threw in a dress shirt, and it looked like I had mascara on because of the sandblasting dust. So that was a good icebreaker. Like, <laughs> yeah, don't worry. That's I'm, a good one. I'm not going on the floor with mascara. This is just kind of what's happened at the time. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was the finance manager. It was just really, what's our crazy? was a really small dealership. Uh, finance manager was also sales, which is rare to find. There was only two or three other sales rep. And uh, the GM was also a sales rep. So small dealership. Um, and Pat, the guy there, uh, who's the GM, he started off as uh, a detailer, worked his way up and uh, sat at the top of the throne there. So basically after shooting the shit with him for about a half hour, he goes, you know what? I see something in you. Um, when can you get your Ombic? And again, I had no idea what this Ombic was. It's, you can get it whenever. Let's go online and buy it. Who knows whatever this thing is. But uh, no, they, they took me on, said they'd see something in me. And he goes, you know what, buddy? I'll, uh, I'll tell you this. You've been with me a year, I, I guarantee you six figures. I had no idea there was no way you could make that kind of money in car sales. Like, not going <laughs> to lie. Never even breathed in my whole, my whole life did I ever think. I didn't really have anybody in my life that was a car salesman. So never really had that connection there. But um, instantly fell in love with it. And uh, here I sit three and a half years later. That's awesome. You know, the one thing I love about both you guys is that, you know, you both have such a huge passion, you know, for cars in the industry, you know, before you even kind of got into it. So it's like, you know, now once you kind of got into the business, you know, that passion just, just, it just comes out and grows through what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, guys, the, the first question I want to um, ask you guys today to kick things off is kind of what's your current norm? Like, I, I've been curious, you know, like, what is it for you right now? I mean, it's Paul, I see that you're in the dealership. And Sean, I'm not sure if you're able to work in the dealership as as of yet. I'm not sure what it is out there. But Sean, we'll actually start with you. What does the current norm look like for you right now, sir? So, yeah, like everybody else, things are a little bit strange. Um, our dealership is open for appointments only. So for sales by appointment only, service department is open uh Basically, their standard hours Monday to Friday, and the sales has changed from Monday to Friday, nine to five, but only by appointment. So, for two and a half days, and we're we're like, you know, expensive cars, so it's a small operation. There isn't a huge staff of sales guys. There's essentially three sales guys with two on uh, two on duty at the moment. So we basically just come in, cover for two and a half days, and then the other guy covers it. Oh, so um, you're you guys are rotating it through right now. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, normally we would have, you know, three guys and everybody sitting in the showroom and things are busy. And right now things would start to get really busy. So you'd sell the bulk of your cars when the sun is shining and you'd order your cars in spring. But right now we're in obviously the height of a global pandemic. So it's a very different situation. And even customers that have the money, they've laid off 250 staff and they're saying to you, uh, I can't, you know, drive through my neighborhood with a brand new McLaren. Like people will... So not a not a great time to show it. that, yeah. Yeah, it's it's and it's not, and I appreciate that. And some people are totally fine with it, comfortable and ready to go and, and pull the trigger. But that's the the feeling that I'm getting from uh, from some people. Um, and also, it's difficult with we're doing exceptional social distancing, and FAF has an incredible uh, an incredible you know cleaning procedure in place. But it's hard to go for a test drive with somebody in a two seater. You know, that's true. So, yeah, you're yeah, definitely not going to be six feet apart from each other. No, no, you're not. You're not. Um, but some people are fine with it, and some people then you just are, are, you know, more in line waiting. But I have, uh, I have an update from 
the factory on when a factory order is coming, a little bit of a, a delay for a lady that I ordered a car from. She said, it's fine. She's going to wait. So the factory orders are still going through. And a lot of those cars, people don't test drive them anyway. They just order the car because you can't order the car. You can't, you can't drive the car. So we're still having people putting through factory orders. Now, our cars are manufactured in the UK. And I think they have the highest death rate in Europe at the moment or the highest number of deaths in Europe. So they're, the factory is just for safety is, is shut at the moment, but production should begin sooner. So it's like everybody else. It's just totally unprecedented. You know, I'm sure, Paul, you're used to seeing a crazy amount of people coming through the door, you know, and, you know, I've been, I, I've, I've been there, but to not see anybody right now is... It's, 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 it's a trip. It's a trip. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah. Looking, yeah. At my, looking at my 180 and my follow-up, you know, normally I'd have like a big, big, uh, big follow-up and a lot of people to call. And now it's like... <laughs> Especially, like, especially right now, say? right? Like, you yeah. know, especially right now. But no, I, I think for a lot of people, you know, I mean, I, I went through the recession, um, you know, and even prior to that, another downturn in the automotive industry. But, you know, this is a lot different. You know, the recession was an economics issue, you know, and it was over six to nine months when things really got bad. This happened two weeks. And, but coming out of the recession, you know, business was a little weird coming out of it, but it's not like what it's going to be with this. Like this, this is something that's going to stay with us for a very long time. And it's going to stay on the customer's mind. I mean, for the most part, this, this time frame, what COVID has done is actually changed the consumer's expectations. You know, I, I, I roll up to a grocery store. I do all my ordering right there. I pop open the hatch, they throw it in. Why the hell would I want to step into a grocery store again? Bottom line, I probably won't, you know, and there's a lot of consumers out there that are kind of thinking, uh, thinking about that. But before we kind of go farther into the new norm, I want to talk a little bit about, Paul, what your current norm is, because I see that you're in the dealership. So what's your current norm, bud? Um, well, to start, I, I just wanted to start off with what you're saying there is uh, I agree that, I mean, out of all of this uncertainty, um, I'm one that always looks at the positive. You always got to look at the positive things. You got to keep that attitude and you got to keep rolling. You can't let that negativity get to you. But uh, I feel like the whole time is going to be changing and this is what we needed uh, to the industry. There's a lot of cavemen, GMs, dealer principals coming out of the cave, banging their sticks, saying this is not, online's not the way to do it. Um, but you got to, I'm telling you right now, I can tell you first person, I uh, had a couple of the cavemen here, couldn't have been happier with their sale. Um, the only time I ever met them was at the time of signing. And uh, they basically said to each other, you know, my grandparents would kill me for buying a vehicle like this never test driving it, never seeing it, literally did not see the vehicle till I rolled it on their driveway. And uh, they left some amazing reviews and I, it really hit me, it hit home that um, not, it's not gonna be for everybody, especially in the used car industry, I get that. Uh, but as long as your manufacturer or um, just say the dealership you're dealing with is gonna back up that product and give them some sort of, you know, kickback that you have 48 hours or you have a week to drive it. Um, and you know, we can do some sort of exchange. I think that we're going to really see this push further. Um, and I, I, it's, it's great, but you're getting an outreach now a lot further than you normally would. You would usually be just strictly local online. You could be endless. So, um, but as for our norm, I'm solo guy here in the uh, showroom. Uh, I work internet leads basically is what it is. Again, same appointment only pretty much as on fix restrictions. Um, I know you said we'll get into our pet peeves later, but I'll start with it now. Ombic has left us <laughs> with so much uncertainty of anything. You can do this, you can't do that. Well, the manufacturer says you can do this, but you can't do that. And the banks say you can do this, but you can't. There's so much miscommunication between all of them. Um, it's so fine line tape. And then you hear about these cops going door to door, pretending to be, you know, Joe and, and Sherry that want to do a test drive and uh, just trying to push to see how the dealerships are dealing with it. Is that not crazy? Um, like, Sean, did you hear, did, Sean, did you hear about this? No, so we, we no. actually we actually had this out here in Ontario where, you know, we have the governing body, OMVIC, and I'm pretty confident, by the way, the way I'm saying OMVIC, I'm confident, I think, between us, or I guess this is going public, I don't really give a crap. Um, <laughs> I, I think OMVIC's the one that actually tipped off the cops. But there's actually cops going around from dealership to dealership and actually checking to see if we're following procedures, and if we're not, they're getting fined. Shit, what is it? Something like a hundred grand or something like that? Geez, yeah, I heard the one we got up there in Toronto got hit. But yeah, great, yeah. Use of, great use of taxpayers' money, isn't it? In oh, oh amazing. Yeah, like let's fantastic. Yeah, phenomenal usage of taxpayers' money and time. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Anyways, Paul, I'm with you on that one. But continue, dude. What's your current norm? Um, so yeah, just uh working leads day by day. Um coming in literally desking deals with uh 
with the skeleton crew we have, the GM and uh, the dealer principal, and just trying to make the best of what we have. Um, there's a, you know, a couple of phase plan of slowly bringing people back. Um, but as we all know, this industry has changed for good. Uh, there's going to be permanent damage to some, and uh, we can sit there and beat, beat on ourselves about it or march forward. But uh, there's going to be a lot of jobs lost out of this. There's no question about that. Um, skeleton crews are going to be slowly built back up, but probably never know what they were again. And if they are, we're not talking for years because uh, if anything, it's opened up the eyes to the GMs and uh, the dealer principals. They can function with half the resources and still have happy clients. Um, and at the end of the day, we're all here to make that dollar. So uh, I really feel that that's kind of where the push has been going. No, that's true. I mean, I think I'm with you there, Paul. I mean, I think how it's going to change the industry is our staffing. I mean, I think I think you're right. I mean, Sean, I know that there's only a handful of people you working at your dealership, but I mean, you know, like an average size dealership employs between 60 to 90 people. You know, and I think a lot of owners out there are going, do I need to continue to do business? with that level of staff. I mean, for example, does it, do I need four people to sell a car? Do I need the BDC person, the sales person, the sales manager, and the F&I manager all to process a singular transaction? So I, I agree with you, man. I think, but I actually think that's as bad as it might be for some people out there, I think it's actually gonna be good for our industry. Because from a consumer's perspective, you know, I don't think anybody wants to come in and deal with four different people. I mean, Sean, at your location, I know typically with those types of brands, that's not normally the case, right? You, you, you probably walk them through more of the, I mean, there's not normally four people that are getting involved in the process, right? Well, basically you have your salesperson who will present all of the uh, cash options, finance lease, uh, and then they'll either close the deal or else uh, basically finalize the deals, finalize the figures with the manager, but your customer wouldn't see the manager. You know, the manager doesn't come down and sit at the table or anything. So you finalize the deal with your manager and then you take the credit application. And we do have, because we have FAF leasing in, in hand, we let FAF leasing take care of the, uh, the leasing side. But for handover, it's basically two people that the, that the customer will see. Now, yeah. in Ireland, when I was in, so in Europe, it's usually one person. So it's just the sales guy. It's start to finish the salesperson, take the credit application, uh, create the lease figures, send the credit application, discuss things with the bank, um, request documents. So that's what I was used to when I came over here. And I felt like I was taking a step backwards. Right. You know I yeah. I thought this is, you know, Canada is going to be so far ahead. And in some ways I thought to myself, oh, wow, yeah, they've got a better system. They've got more people involved and, you know, specific people for specific tasks. But then over the last year, people have been saying to me, oh, yeah, Canada now is going to, you know, just go down to one, uh, you know, one person, one experience. And and then I was like, oh, OK, so. I think it's funny because you're like, well, I've been doing that for a long time. Yeah. What do you mean? That's not new. Yeah, exactly. So I thought that I thought that initially maybe in, in you know North America that that was the way that it was done and then they brought in all these extra people and extra procedures um, to make things easier but it doesn't it, it's definitely complicated the process um, and you're when you you know too many cooks when you have more people a lot of the time something gets dropped or I've had situations where you know somebody drops the ball and then or you know I don't send the correct email to the correct person and then something is missing, you know, or the battery tender wasn't well, left. You guys know why, why that started that way. The, 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 the idea was, is that more cooks generated more profit. That's really what it was, is yeah, that yeah. the more people kind of got involved into it. All right. You know, so the idea is, you know, you, you might have a BDC person, they'd set you up, bring you in. Right. Then you have the salesperson do for salesperson do its kind of initial sell. Right. Sales manager come in, get a bump. Did you guys ever? Did you guys ever get asked? That's really common in the states. I don't know how common it is here in Canada. Did you ever get asked to go back and get a bump? <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So you get the bump, right? And then the F and I manager would take another crack at it. So the, the 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 ongoing thought was more cooks, more money. But you know, to your point, Sean, I don't think that's true at all. Like I think mm -hmm. the customer gets overwhelmed. All right, mm -hmm. it takes three times longer now. There's a reason why buying a car, you know, takes three and a half hours because you got to deal with three or four different people so much so much longer exactly you know, right when i was delivering cars in europe an hour uh here you, it could be four like four it's hours it's crazy isn't it insane Time kills deals we know this yeah 
yeah it's it's just it's a, it's intense and i've never lost a deal i've never lost a deal um we'll say in, on, on like an hour handover but on a four hour handover people have people can have a meltdown they're like am i doing the right thing and a lot of time they get to think about a lot of stuff but it's it, also it's just like yeah. it's like give me the hell out of here yeah you're not yeah. serving your food cold yeah you're coming out you're serving <laughs> right out of the kitchen that's how it should yeah, be yeah, yeah. The industry. yeah it's actually it's actually a really good analogy so i mean guys really kind of question like are we actually is this actually new you know like is is is, is the industry having to adapt to something new or is really the industry's having to catch up to what the customer's expectations catch are up. we know the internet's taken right? over a long time ago. Yeah, like like right. we, we know the customer wants to engage and you know uh, i guess kind of check off as many boxes to the process as they can before they come into the dealership oh. you know so that way their, their time is spent you know appropriately you know I, I like i don't just show up to my barber to get a haircut you know and wait for two hours until i can sit in the chair you know i, I schedule my appointment make sure that my time is used properly so i can get in and get out you know it's like this is kind of no different than you know customers wanting to do that they're wanting to be more efficient with their time and you know in the past we've always we've defined what the process is no 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 mr customer you mm -hmm. might want to be efficient but we have a four-hour process and if you want to buy a car from this dealership that's the case and i think it is because the social effects that covid has now brought to our industry is that that's not acceptable anymore it's not acceptable that we require a customer to come into the dealership and spend three to four hours to buy a car from us. In fact, actually, in some cases, may not even be legal. <laughs> like, we'll see how things kind of play out, right? But actually, let's do that. That's actually the best segue into our my next question for you guys is how do you see the new norm kind of evolving and what does it look like for you as a salesperson? Sean, I'll start with you. So what I think is going to happen, non-essential um, customer facing or non customer facing staff will not see the customer anymore. So finance offices will not see the customer salesperson will be responsible for getting all that information. So it will limit the amount of people that the customer sees and it will, um, expedite the time that it takes to get your car delivered. I think there'll be more people ordering cars sight unseen, especially elderly people, you know, a Toyota is going to drive like a Toyota. A BMW is going to drive like a BMW. And usually it's not going to be that person's first car. And a lot of people do just like shopping for cars and they come in and spend their time. But the fear aspect and the fear that the media are pumping into these people is going to prevent them from leaving their house. So you'll see more people putting, putting their order in online, picking their color online. Maybe you bring drive a car outside their house to show them the color of the car but it's not going to be somebody coming in, spending two hours on a Saturday or on a Sunday, talking to a sales guy, talking to a sales manager, talking to F and I, then going home, then coming back the next week to do it. They're going to have now, their research. I'm curious online. on your side of the Sean, like with, you know, on the luxury side of the business, do you get a lot of that in the first place? I mean, it's not like people can just roll up and let me see the 12 different colors, you know, of a McLaren yeah. that are currently available. <laughs> so it's all very different. I have, um, we'll say pre COVID what a sale would look like for me, there would be a couple of different variants. Sometimes you'd have a customer who has usually a McLaren isn't your first supercar. It's a, it's a bespoke supercar really. And, uh, it's uh, very much for the guys who are in the know in the supercar scene and it's a newer brand as well, but it's 70 years old, but newer on the actual newer on the street. So to give you an idea, we'd have customers who are very, very experienced. They'll come in. They'll test drive the car. They'll pick their color and buy the car. Some guys will want the car now, don't want to wait, and will take what you'll have in inventory, which will be obviously you know, a different selection. McLaren has something that you'll call MSO, which is McLaren Special Operations. So if you want you know, an, orange, uh, an orange roof with you know, pink wheels and black sides, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, that car wouldn't look great. But whatever it is, McLaren will make it. So... It will obviously increase the price and increase the timeline, but we do have vehicles ready to go. So it can be very, very bespoke or it can be ready to go. Um, now, the timeline on ordering the car, there isn't many um, one day deals. Yeah, say, you're, you're having, you have to think a lot ahead. You know, yeah. when you're making that kind of purchase, it's, um, yeah. I mean, I imagine there, it's the occasional, oh, this weekend's a beautiful weekend. I think I'm going to go buy a McLaren. 
um <laughs> but our customers during the week, nice weekends they're in maui or they're you know on the island that's a good they're point they're not there we're, we're really busy um monday to friday because those people are on their own timeline typically and then if it's a long weekend or something we could be dead you know some oh, of that's kind of funny isn't that isn't that kind of like the polar opposite to what we what, you yeah. know what you do with paul it's like it's the other way around monday and fridays can be quiet and then the weekends are are crazy um hey, real quick though sean before i get over to you paul um how how do you see the that luxury buyer that supercar luxury buyer changing do you see much change you know in in the future well so if a guy is worth $50 million or he's worth $30 million, he's still going to buy. He's still going to buy what he wants to buy. Now, the secondhand market, I think, will, will suffer a little bit in, in our cars, as in the prices of the vehicles will go down more. That's what I think. That's what I envision will happen. I think factories, most of the supercars being produced in the world are being produced in Europe. Europe has been hit very hard. So the factory output is going to be very slow over the next 12 to 24 months. That's my opinion there. And I just think that it's going to be like other dealerships, social distancing, sterilization of the working area, and sterilization of the vehicle. So that that's it. I, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you what. what no, is that makes sense because that's because on you for your side, it's it's more of an economics thing. Yeah. You know, if, if their yeah. business wasn't affected, you know, they still have the net worth and they'll still buy the car. You know, if their yeah. business was affected that much, then they won't. Um, yeah. so, and that, that makes sense, which is a little different, right? You know, for, for like Paul, for yourself, where it's like more, that type of form of transportation is a requirement. I got to get from home to work. So I have to buy something. So, now, so. You know, now, Paul, how do you kind of see the, the new norm playing out for yourself, um, man? I don't know, like in all honesty, the way I see it just to, put it out as easy to, to take in is from what I hear the eighties were for car sales to what we have now, we're going to see another change like that again, moving forward. Um, we're going to be talking about the good old days of when we used to be able to shake a customer's hand and uh, put them down beside us and work them down and get the numbers right. But um, it's the expectations of the customers that change. That's ideally where this whole move is going to shift everything. Um, the whole idea of, you know, front door delivery, I've been doing that since I got in the game just because I've been long. My whole, my whole slogan is long after your sale. Um, after one of the, uh, the Detroit trips, we went up there. The one girl, the speaker there said, you know, you gotta be not a one night stand. And that's, I don't know how many times I've used that line with my customers. I'm not a one night stand. I'm here long after the sale. Um, but I've, you know, I've done eight hour deliveries where you drive it out to Niagara falls or, or wherever. But then, you know, that guy met me with a 60 pounder whiskey. I go drop it off now and it's, they're, they're expecting it, right? Um, it's just going to be the expectations of what they really want out of. That's true. The customer's sales. expectations changed a lot. Exactly. You're just going to have to adjust with the ride of, uh, of that. And I mean, slowly, I mean, internet, we knew where this was going. Jay, you and me both know um, social media, internet, that's the king of the industry, especially for any sort of used car market. Um, keeping the idea that customers don't have to go lot to lot anymore. They literally find the best price or they find the vehicle they want. They know what they want well before they come in and see you. I just think this is going to really put this a lot more in the uh, the pavement and push it that the customer is going to be well educated, the customer is going to be well informed, and he's going to have higher expectations than what he did have, um, say pre COVID. That's, that's pretty well, much where I see the difference. You know, the the whole eight hours, you know, for you to travel out there and go do that. Look, I think that is one thing that dealerships are going to have to think. I actually, the ironic thing is, I think the time for an entire transaction is actually going to get longer for us as a dealership because of the things that we're going to have to do you know like we're going to have to communicate more online we're going to, have to communicate more over the phone we're going to have to really prep the customer before they actually come into the dealership right you know we're, there's so there's a lot of prep work that the dealership's going to have to do and then to your point paul there's a lot of after the sale work that we're going to do. I mean, I don't think the delivery to your point for a fair amount of people out there is going to be as simple as just, all right, I got the keys. You know, when are you coming into the dealership to pick them up? And, you know, yeah. here's the keys and have a nice day. Now, I mean, I mentioned Sean, a delivery doesn't look like that for you at all. Um, you know, just do on deliveries, do, Sean, do you do mostly home deliveries? No. Uh, Most people will maybe, come into the dealership. Maybe done two, maybe done two home deliveries. Um, I wouldn't like to drive the car myself when it's not my car i guess that's when true it's not the dealership's car and it's paid in full i'd request the customer come in and collect it normally um you're talking about five hundred thousand dollar car 
I don't want to be responsible for that while it's in somebody else's name, even on a even on a deep plate. I'd prefer if the customer came in um, normally. But just for example, have you guys ordered a Starbucks recently? Oh yeah, that's a perfect example. Did yeah. I oh, order it in advance? You think? Did you ever think that you'd order every single thing you wanted from Starbucks over the phone, wait outside in a queue, <laughs> then go and get your Starbucks? It just has to be like that because of people's expectations. We've had like we've had you know. If this happened in the 80s, which it, which it happened in the 70s, and it was called, uh, I think it was called the Hong Kong flu. Now, I'm not insulting anybody. That's what it was called at the time. And I think it killed 100,000 Americans in, in the 70s and 80s. But we didn't have social media. We didn't have, you know, a globalized world like we do now. So we didn't know to shut down the world and we didn't know, you know, how to prevent these things from spreading. So I, I'm not as, I suppose, concerned about everybody catching this and, and dying but the media make it that way. So as a result of that, it's going to all change to far, you know, distancing. So you're going to order your car online. You might not ever see the car or ever see the sales guy until you're either collecting it or it gets to you. You know, it could be like everything is going to have to go DocuSign now or digital sign. You're going to avoid a guy for three weeks buying your car and then come in and sit, you know, a couple of feet across from him or pick up a pen that somebody else held in the dealership a few minutes ago. It's all going to be digital. Like, Think about, you know, buying a, the process of buying a car is it's so long. If you buy a, a home, you want to buy real estate, it's probably quicker than buying. I agree. I think the process is faster. Cars in, in, in Canada, if you decide I want to buy that piece of real estate, you spend less time talking to the salesperson. You go in and you look at the property for 35 minutes and then you spend, you know, whatever time you spend researching the home, which you probably said spend researching the car. And then you do your sign and you go into your bank and it's, it's, it's the same process, but just shorter. Like it's, it's crazy. We're just going to see, I, I think it's going to be quicker, significantly quicker for the customer. And I think that it's going to be better for the salespeople. There's going to be less negotiation and more time to actually sell. So less face-to-face -face interaction for three hours, showing them all the buttons. You're going to have to do more videos and shorten videos to keep that customer's attention. We use things like see it now and stuff for customers who are out of province or far away. So I think it's going to be a smoother, faster sales process, but the companies that don't bring in those sales processes are going to fail because I agree. If it's an, if it's, you know, look at Tesla, you know, those guys have, they've got it down to a, a fine art. It's smooth, quick. That's the color. That's the car. You want to see the car. It's sitting in the showroom there. You know, it's sitting online and you can basically get a virtual tour, pick your color, pick your options. I, I think that's the way it will go. I didn't think it was going to go that way for five to 10 years. I thought we still have, you know, the face-to-face -face interactions and that. And I've got some friends that used to work in, in Tesla dealerships and they said, this is coming, this is coming. But this is, the COVID is just propelling what they do. So if you want to see what the automotive industry looks like, look at companies like you know, Tesla, that's, that's, that's what you, that's what you're going to say. Like probably the least affected ones out of all of this for process yep. being changed. Yep. Um, exactly. Very minute, if any process being changed, uh, besides, you know, sitting in the showroom, I yep. feel like that is exact dead on what you're saying there. That, uh, that's yep. the last one to really be taking the effects of COVID because they've been practicing everything we've been doing now long before this, just in the process. You, you know what you, you said something sean that uh, kind of resonated is you know the tesla approach right well take a look at tesla dealerships they're not 12 and a half million dollar shopping malls like some of these other dealerships are built like so yeah what are you guys' thoughts like i think what the requirements for a physical dealership is going to fundamentally change you know, if the customer continues to want to do less of that process actually at the physical location, do we have to build these monster buildings in these prime real estate areas and have this tremendous cost, you know, or do we go to more of like what Tesla's done? And I just set up shop in a mall or a small retail type space and only have two or three cars in my showroom and, you know, just be able to really kind of bring it bring the experience of the dealership to them and not have to bring them into the dealership. What's your guys' thoughts on that, Sean? So I think it's going to be, like you said, three or four cars in a showroom, limited contact, everything's going to be online and the dealerships are going to have warehouses or underground storage facilities where they keep their vehicles. That's where the vehicles are going to be reconditioned, prepped. So McLaren is on where I work is it's on a prime bit of real estate. Real estate is, you know, 
expensive, oh. really expensive in Vancouver. It's it is very expensive, expensive. very similar to you Toronto. Know, we have, you know, four cars in our showroom, five cars in our showroom, and then we have a, 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 a used car showroom in the back with maybe another five cars. So 10 cars in total, you could say. And then we have the rest of our vehicles in storage. So if you want to see those vehicles, you make an appointment, we bring up the car and you see the car. Now you could come in and you could see a model similar to the car that you're going to buy. And then you come in and pick the car that you want to buy on the day. But I think the days of just mega, mega dealerships, you know, huge real estate, even for the likes of, you know, Google or uh, Amazon, these guys, maybe not Amazon because they're sorry, they're storage, but Google, these guys, this is an incredible experiment for them. They're going to see how, how many staff do we need to actually keep in the building? I, I had you know, a good point. I actually have a few people. salespeople that are working deals at home right now yeah. and are actually closing higher than they did when they were working inside the dealership. Well, if you can get 80% productivity for 50% real estate costs, there you go. You're, make, you're, you're making money straight away. You're just, you're just balancing your, your books in, in, a, in a better situation. You might be selling less cars and getting a little bit less productivity, but your costs are way down. So if you... We're going to just see like an incredible transition. I think we've got five years of uh, recession and depression. I think that's, you know, for Canada, I think a million people are collecting welfare, probably more at 2000, uh, sorry, uh, at approximately two and 3000. That's two to three billion a month that the Canadian government are giving to people. Who's, who's paying for those bills? We are. So as a direct result of that, we're going to see we have to see tax increases or, or some kind of a change to, to our, to our economy. And I, and I know what they're doing. They're trying to save lives. I, and I totally respect that, but there is going to be a price to pay at the well, end. Well, there, there is an economic expense and you don't seem yeah. to hear that enough. Yeah. Now the, the funny thing is here's actually for our automotive industry. Um, I have, there's a lot of experts out there that are claiming that we're going to come out of this and we're just going to go into a more of a declined, you know, period. And actually I think here in Canada, we're not, you know, everybody that's been in market for a car for the last couple months, look, they're still in market for a car. But the number that I, you know, that I'm most interested in is the number I don't hear a lot of people talking about is like here in Ontario. You know, the one and a half million people that we have in Ontario that rely on the public transit system. Uh, how many of those are not going to want to jump back on a train or get in a bus? You know, and are going to be interested in a three hundred dollar a month lease on an inexpensive economy car. You know, like I, I actually think that that this is from a social perspective going to actually increase automotive sales. Paul, what do you think? Um, I, I agree completely with you uh, on that. I mean, as we know, dealer groups pretty much run the dealership world now, and ninety uh, percent of them never set foot into the dealership itself. Those we are stats. So overhead is king, and uh, they can slash a budget. Why wouldn't they? Well, I mean, Paul, would you like, I mean, think about this. Like if they told you, Paul, that you could spend, you could work half your time at home right now. I mean, mm. and then only, not, like, then not only, okay, maybe not friend. for you. Maybe I'm not for you. Alcoholic, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally got a hold of like about a week and a half out of being on this layoff. I was like, like guys, you, you need, you need to get into it. Fat or an alcohol. So get me into doing something there. <laughs> um, but no, like to lightly touch on something of the big changes I really see happening here. Um, and I mean, again, this is just out of sales part. And I know with my brief stint with luxury brand, uh, it's a different world. Um, us as domestic, 70% of our income comes from service. Um, we're at a luxury brand, 70% of the dealership, 80% of the dealership's profits come from sales itself. Um, so what I'm saying is service is really what's going to be the big change as well. Doing this, I mean, we offer now valet. Um, basically, you want an oil change? Come pick it up. We'll drive it back off. So you're still going to need these big infrastructures, but... They're going to be service based more. Um, and then you're going to have the smaller showroom. So you're going to base a lot more of, of that money and that time towards, at, at least in the domestic brand, is towards your service um, and your ongoing parts, like stuff like that. I really think is going to be a change. You don't need a massive showroom anymore because, let's face it, guys, no one's going to control around the 30 cars in the showroom anymore. But your service center is definitely going to need a little bit more room because we're going to try and pump more into that, right? So, yeah, it's kind of that you're right. I think um, a lot of the auto industry needs to focus on is not so much where the showroom's doing, but what are they doing to keep these customers in service? I mean, we all have seen the decline, uh, but we were still, you know, essential, still kept 
a majority of our mechanics in the back running through the chaos of all this. I'm not going to say it wasn't slow at times, but uh, I think they need to really focus on that because, I mean, that's the bread and butter at the end of the day, being a domestic brand. So. 100%. I totally agree with you on that. Um, hey, guys, I know it's getting towards the tail end of our time today, and I want to thank you both for jamming with me. This has been a lot of fun. But before I let you guys go, I get to ask my favorite question of the day. Now, I prepped you guys before we started this conversation, so I know you've both had some time, so I imagine I'm going to get something juicy out of the both of you. But, uh, Sean, I'm going to start off with you. I want to know, what is pissing Sean off? I think fear mongering. I think the fear mongering is the biggest thing that's pissing me off, you know? Um, like we're, people are resilient. I know that there's elderly people and, and, and sick people and people who are at risk, but like, it'd be safe to say that if one of the three of us contacted COVID, you know, contacted COVID or contracted COVID, we'd probably survive like highly, highly likely that we'd survive. And, and to lock down everybody, like if you look at what they've done in Sweden, so, you know, maybe I'm going to get a bit of hate for this, but in Sweden, there's no lockdown. Their country is open. There is no lockdown. They have just issued government, basically, decrees on, on how to do social distancing, how to wash your hands, how to, you know, be hygienic, how to be hygienic around other people and for elderly people and for sick people to stay indoors or stay away from large gatherings. I, I'm like... Ireland has total lockdown. You know, you can't go two kilometers from your house and Ireland has a higher infection rate than Sweden. So it isn't everything. We've basically turned the Western world into like a dr dr draconian lockdown. We should have kept the economies moving and provided the CERB and the EI to the people who were in need who needed it. And if you didn't want to work, and you are, you know, having a mental breakdown, tell your employer and your employer would let you go. But there are people right now who want to work, you know, like yeah, there there's a lot who, who want to work and who need to make money. Like, you know, there are people who can, who have businesses and have mortgages and either need to decide whether they're going to pay their home, their mortgage payment or their, or their lease for their business. And we're going to see a huge, huge effect of those people. I'd like to know how many people are going to, you know, commit suicide because of depression, because of debt, or how many people, how many kids are going to go to bed hungry, or, you know, how many domestic abuse cases are there going to be, or divorces? Well, if you get divorced now, you're going to get divorced anyway, eventually. That's true. But, but, I, but you know, and it's maybe it's maybe I, maybe I'm wrong, and I'm not an economist, and I'm not. No, no, uh, no. I look, look. There, there's there, this is so different. It's you know, it's unprecedented, right? I mean, there, there, there's an economics effects. There is the social effects, and you know, I think for a lot of people, there there are going to be some mental effects that go along with this. I mean, I think everyone's coping the way that they can, and there's going to be very, huge variations of that. Well said, thanks, Sean. Um, hey, Paul, for yourself. All right. I know there's a lot of stuff that pisses the Dodge yeah, father off. Paul so <laughs> just so you know, I only got so much time on this podcast. Okay, Paul. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we just do a whole podcast just for Paul's rants. Um, but all right, man, what is pissing off Paul Long, the Dodge father? Well, basically what I started off with your brother, um, Ombic, they're fucking killing us. They are not letting us know anything at all. I mean, the restrictions, as you said, they're sending these cops out seeing what the hell these dealerships are doing, finding us ridiculous amounts. And uh, they haven't gotten in bed with the banks or our manufacturers to say, okay, guys, this is the set plan we have. Um, that's It's killing me. We really have so many. I, I had an email come up the other day that was uh, one of our guys in our dealer group that reached out to someone in Ombic. Okay, so Friday we got released. We can open our showrooms Monday. What are the details? What are the restrictions? What am I going to get fined for? And uh, I'll tell you, it was a joke of an email reply back. You know, it's it's basically like the whole idea: you can do this, but only if you do this. But you can do this if you you know. They don't they don't basically give us any direction, and uh, it's been the toughest part through all of this because I know Omvic is one of the hardest restrictions we have out of anybody in car sales. I know a lot of guys come down from Alberta and they go, "This is a fucking joke compared to what we were rolling with before the shit we got away with back there to Omvic." But um, no, get together. And let's figure out a plan to make this all the same. We can't sit there and say, you know, you can go on test drives, but you got to sit in the back seat. But if they don't want to have a back seat, then you can sit shotgun. 
Um, but you, if the customer doesn't want to, like, figure it out, guys. Put the restrictions out. And again, we work customer to customer. I had a customer come in, pretty much look like a hazmat suit. All by all means, buddy, if that's what you need to, to feel yourself protected, cool. I got other guys out there still trying to shake my hand. Um, you, you deal with customer to customer, seeing how they ideally, you know, want to be treated. Um, obviously, I don't need to get into this whole what we're doing for COVID. Everybody under the sun knows they're being sterile. They're, they're putting the gloves on. They're doing the shit that needs to be done. All right. I don't think we need to focus on all these damn commercials anymore showing this is what we're doing to make this COVID friendly. No, just put the shit out so we know what we're supposed to be doing and everybody's being compliant with it. That's pretty much where we need to be going with this. I'm with you, Paul. I look, I, there's been a lot of, let's say, counterproductive communications coming out from different levels of government, for sure. Quick, uh, quick one for you guys, just before we go, I know everybody's on time restraints. Now, so if COVID wasn't happening, we'd be talking about the biggest oil crisis of our time. What do all exactly. of our vehicles It's actually true. Run Good run point. Oil. So like, how is that going to affect the automotive industry? 99% of vehicles on the road in the world are, are run on, you know, uh, petroleum-based fuels. So how, well, in your opinion, I'd like to know what you guys think, how that's going to affect. Well, you, you know what the funny thing is? I don't think anybody's even thinking about it because right oh. now they're looking at the lowest cost that they've ever paid at the pump. Like ever, up a Ram for sixty bucks, like, dude. I'm serious. I'm the same way. Like I got, I got, I got my big Armada, and I filled it up the other day for like seventy bucks, and I was like, what yeah. the hell the last is this? I've had with customers is fuel efficiency on a Ram lately. I'll tell you that right now, okay? <laughs> but no, I look. I, I, I again, I think when we get into this new norm, when you know we kind of enter into the space where the government says we can, you know, pop our heads out of our caves and start exploring, you know, I think that's that that is actually when we're really going to truly feel the economics mm -hmm. of everything that's going on right now. And uh, to your point, Sean, I, I agree with you. I, I think we're we're staring down the barrel of a recession. I look. I know I use the R word. Sorry, guys. Is what it is. You know, but there's 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 a lot. There, there, there's a lot of economics that's just not being shown right now because we're so it's focused hunger. on the social elements of it. For your listeners out there who are, you know, hustlers and hungry, everybody on this podcast knows that during a recession, that's when people who have drive and determination make the most money. So don't let it be a dirty word. We're going to see if you live to be 75 years old, you see three recessions and, and uh, one depression. So get used to it. You know, we had our last one in 20, in 2008, 2009. We have this one probably a year or two years early. And we'll have another one in 12 years again. So you just need to work harder. There, there, there are going to be guys who are going to make more money next year than they did in, you know, 2017. Because that's a good point. A, Very good point. They, they're incredible workers. They work hard. So whether there's a recession or not, we live in the, probably the greatest time to be alive and the greatest time to make money. So just put in the hours, you know, work harder. If the market is down 20%, work 35% harder. Well, no, I'm with you. I mean, I think, you know, look, we've... As an industry, we'll just kind of use the automotive industry for example, right? I mean, you know, not including this last year, but for the five years prior to that, we were running double digit gains quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter. I mean, it was ridiculous. You know, if you could pretty much half ass your way through operations, you could make a decent amount of money. That's not going to be the case anymore. And to your point, Sean, I mean, it's going to be kind of that, you know, cream rises, right? And we're going to see that in every single aspect. We're going to see that in business owners. We're going to see that in operations. We're going to see that in salespeople. I think a lot of sales professionals or salespeople, whatever you want to call them, all right, are not going to survive this because they weren't that good in the first place. And now they're really going to have to step them, step up their game. You know, but, the week, my friend, that's this, where this is going, right? As you know, the strong, the hustle, the people that are going to put in that everyday hustle are going to be the ones that, this is nothing new to us, but you just put in your hustle, put in the game and keep going forward. That's it. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. It, it's the ones that are going to adapt to the change quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's not, and it's our tactics, our business. I mean, look, I just got done with a call this morning that went almost two hours long. And it was literally how we're going to re- introduce you know digital dealership solutions which is the agency side you know i mean we lost over almost 90 percent of our business you know and like do we expect some percentage of that to come back yeah but do i expect all of it to come back hell no you know so it's like we're already trying to figure out and redesign what that business is going to look like going into this new norm and everybody's going to have to do it both personally from a business perspective everyone's going to have to look at that 
Good. Hey, Sean, I'm glad you brought that up. I really appreciate that. That was fun to chat about. Hey, guys, um, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a blast to do. Um, you guys have yourself... Oh, oh, no, sorry. Actually, wait, before we go, I totally forgot. Uh, for everyone out there that's watching and listening right now and would love to connect with you and learn more about what you guys are up to, what's the best way to do so? Sean, I'll start with you. Um, linked, uh, LinkedIn, Sean and Donnellan. Uh, Instagram, Sean underscore McLaren Van um twitter sean donnell and facebook sean donnell or yeah yeah join the conversation guys if i can uh help anybody in any way or anybody has any questions and you know they want to want to chat about kind of what they think is happening you know would love to would love to talk and guys if you listen and you're a fan of my podcast you need to go follow sean's do that hit the subscribe button hey paul for yourself what's the best way to connect with you brother love it Hashtag the Dodge Father, brother. Google, hashtag the Dodge Father, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. I'm there for you guys. Uh, the Dodge Father at fourcitydodge.ca. I mean, you guys know where to find me. I'm here to help you guys. So. That's true. You're everywhere. Hey, again, hey, guys, again, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a lot of fun. You guys have yourself an amazing day. All right. Great talking, buddy. See you guys. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Paul. See you guys.